you've got your Bible or a, a copy of the scriptures on your phone through an app or whatever, if you would find 1 Corinthians chapter 15 with me. Uh, we're going to be in two primary passages of scripture today. One in, in 1 Corinthians 15, just to kind of find a launch point into um, what I believe God wants us to, to explore today. And then we'll spend the rest of our time in Luke, the gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 24. I know last week was Easter, and man, what an awesome reports that you've, you've just been given about God's work here among you. Um, but I, I also realize that after Easter, we, we sometimes kind of build up to Easter, and Easter is a huge moment for us. And then after that moment, maybe the week that follows, we can kind of fall into a lull and maybe a, a little bit of discouragement. It's kind of that letdown moment after, a, after we've poured our heart into something that coming off of something big sometimes leaves us feeling a little bit empty and and I don't want that to be the case for you I want you to walk out of here today feeling full and renewed and I, I really want to talk to you about hope and how you can encounter that last week you explored as many churches did the idea that Christ is no longer dead but he's he's alive he's risen uh, he rose from the dead but to get to that point he endured incredible suffering Paul would write about it and he would just tell us some of the some of the the maybe the lowlights the, the challenges that he had to face as, as you know the Bible says that he was falsely accused Jesus he was he was wrongly arrested he was taken he was beaten he was later nailed to a cross he was he was uh, uh, forced to wear a crown of thorns and and as it was pressed into his brow his 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 skin began to burst and blood began to to, to flow down his face after suffering scripture says under the weight of our sin under the weight of our sin he gives up his life willingly now don't miss it he it wasn't taken from him it wasn't stolen from him he wasn't defeated he gave up his life willingly as a sacrifice for you and for me and for everyone on this planet that we might have hope he died. And scripture says that just to prove that his death was final and kind of make sure things were moving in a rapid manner, the, the Roman guards around took a spear and they jabbed it up through his side. And as they did, blood and water flowed out. After a short while, the, the disciples and those who were close to Jesus were called and they came and they grabbed him, pulled him down off of the cross. They wrapped him. They put him in a borrowed tomb. Scripture says he laid there three days and then he arose. What's really remarkable is that the Roman guards were posted in front of the tomb and a, a large stone um, was, was, was delivered and rolled up in front of that tomb where they were standing because they were, they were concerned that something might happen that could possibly change the direction of their world. They had no idea what was about to happen. Scripture says that angels came and, and the angel moved the rock and, and, uh, and, and Christ had arisen and he comes out. The guards had already run out of fear and the tomb was left empty. It's what we celebrated last week. It's, it's, it's what all of our, 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 our faith really settles on. Paul writes about this and he just reminds us that Jesus is alive. And again, if you've got your copy of scripture, look at it with me. 1 Corinthians 15, beginning in verse 1, he writes, Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, when you received, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. For, for he says, by this gospel you were saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preach to you, otherwise you've just believed in vain. Verse 3, he continues, he says, For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And all of that is good news. That's, that's the story of our faith. That's the, 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 the most critical part of our, of our journey in, 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 in Christendom or in faith. It's, it's, it's remembering and acknowledging all that he's done. But Paul would go on later to say just a few verses down in verse 14. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is useless and so is your faith. 
More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God. For we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. Here's the sad part. He says, you're still in your sins. Verse 18, then those who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. I mean, this is like hopelessness, right? If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we of all people must be pitied. And those are sobering words. You know what Paul describes here? He describes something that is so critical that if it's removed, everything falls apart. It reminds me of the game Jenga. Anybody familiar with Jenga? I started to bring one. I've got some friends who have made like this, this massive set of Jenga. Like it stands like this high, big blocks. But, but Jenga is this, it, it's, it's noted to be like the third most popular game in America right now. Jenga, it's made with, with blocks that are stacked in, in sets of three, and they're, they're alternating as they're, as they're stacked, and they, they build a tower. But the way this game is played is, if it's your turn, you take a moment, and you push out or pull out one of the blocks, and as you do, you pull it out, and then you place it back on top, and then the next person pulls one out, and they place it on top, and another person pulls one out, and they place it on top, and this continues, this pulling and placing and pulling and placing until until someone pulls that one most critical piece, the one that holds everything up. And when you pull it out, when you pull it out, it's, it's a little bit tighter, it's a little harder, but when it's tugged and it's pulled out, everything is waiting on that and everything is, is finding its position because of the strength of that one piece. And when you pull that out and you go to place it, the entire tower collapses. And Paul is saying, in essence, this thing we call faith it's like the Tower of Jenga. And if you pull out the one piece, the piece called the resurrection, if you pull that out, then everything that you know, everything you've believed, everything you've built your life on, everything you've hoped in, everything possible based on Scripture falls apart and it simply becomes a ruined story of hopelessness. Man, what a, what a sad deal if the resurrection is not real. But Paul adds one more thought, and I didn't put this in your notes, but if you're looking at the scripture, drop down to verse 20. In verse 20, he sums it up with this encouraging word. Having said all that, he says, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. Paul says there is no reason to despair that your hope should continue to increase and you can, can continue to walk in confidence that what you've believed in, the one you've believed upon, has risen from the dead. He is no longer dead. He paid the price for your sin, but then he got up. And so you and I, we can have hope. Can you say amen to that? We can have hope. Come on, one more time. You can say it a little bit stronger, a little bit louder. Can you say praise the Lord for the hope that we have in Christ? Amen? Amen. We have hope. We have hope. And yet, after a week of celebration and jubilee, like last week, it's possible to walk back into the realities of our world. Leaving a service like you had last week. Hearing people give their heart to Christ and their lives transformed and go right back into the mundane routines of our daily life and find ourselves in a place maybe of discouragement or, or despair. It's possible to come off of that mountaintop and feel like we're back in the valley. So what do we do after Easter? How do we regain hope? How do we encounter hope after Easter? Well, I'm glad you asked, because that's what I want to spend our time talking about. If you've got your, your Bible still open, flip back, if you would, to Luke's Gospel, the very last chapter, Luke chapter 24. It's a great story that Luke kind of ends with as he wraps up his, his retelling of all that Christ did and those who followed him, as he talks about people like you and me, two followers who along the way found themselves post-Easter resurrection moment a little bit depressed, discouraged, and, and disheartened. 
And what happens to them, I think, can happen to us. But what Christ does in them, I know Christ can do in us. And that's restore hope. Beginning in verse 13, we read these words. Luke says, now that same day, this is speaking of the resurrection, that same day, two of them, two followers, were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. And as they talked and discussed these things with each other, get this, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. Verse 17 says, he asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? Jesus says, what things? About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. Let me just take a time out for a moment. These guys were, were finding themselves really heavy-hearted because of the experience of watching Jesus die. But there's something that I, I don't want you to miss in just this, this brief story that's already taken place. These guys were followers. They were disciples. Now, they weren't a part of the, the, the 12. They weren't that first elite group of, of Christ followers, the 12. But it's, it, scholars tell us they were probably part of the, the group of 70, that next group, uh, that next tier of, of close as companions to Jesus. These guys would have believed that Jesus was, as Peter defined him or described him when, when confronted by Jesus about this, who am I, that he was Christ, the Messiah, the son of the living God. Like these guys were followers because they believed Jesus to be the promised one who had come from heaven to earth, who was gonna be the deliverer of, of all of their, 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 their fears, the deliverer who would come in and, and wipe out all of the pain and all the suffering who would deal with those who were in, in opposition to them, that Jesus was going to be the one who was going to come forth from among the crowd to rise up to, to kind of chart a new course of, of life and hope. They believed him to be the Messiah. But in this moment, because of their circumstances, now everything has changed. And now they no longer call him the Messiah. What did they say? They said, he was a good prophet. There's a big step between prophet and Messiah. They believed he was the Messiah, and today, because of their experience, now they decide, well, he's just a prophet. Can I just kind of give you a warning based on their life? Don't allow your circumstances and your experiences to determine your theology. Let the word of God and the promises of God and the, revel, the, 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 the revel, revelation of God in your life be that which determines your theology. Allow those things that God is saying and working and doing in you to be, to be defined by his word. Let the word of God determine your theology, not your experience. Because if you get lost in that, man, every day that you have a bad day, God is no longer on the throne. Like every day that things don't go your way, all of a sudden hope is lost and, 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 and you might as well just give up. But the promises of God are true. His word remains true. And you can build your life on that even when your experiences tell you something different. Let's continue verse 20. It says the chief priests, and these guys are still talking, the chief priests and our rulers handed him, Jesus, over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped, we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it's the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that, he had, that, that, that they had seen a vision of angels. Angels who said he was alive. And then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. This is a problem 
They did not see Jesus. These guys didn't see Jesus. Those who ran to the tomb didn't see Jesus. The ladies who had gone to the tomb didn't see Jesus. But the summation of all of these guys, the, the disciples and then these two, were that since we don't see him, then he does not exist. Since we don't see him, then he's no longer alive. Because if we could see him, then we would believe. Isn't it interesting that Jesus here comes up and he's walking with them, but he, he does like one of those Jedi mind tricks, like he, he doesn't want them to see him. You don't see me, right? I don't know how that happened, but, but what, what's interesting is he's walking with them, but they don't recognize him. I think that Jesus wanted them first to see him with their heart and with their faith before with their eyes, because the eyes are the, really the least important. It's, it's what happens in the heart and in the faith that, that makes the, the greatest difference. Listen, we'll continue this story in just a moment. We'll pick up where we left off here in just a moment. But I, I want to just point out a few things about hope in this story and, 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 and encourage you to, to latch on to the hope of Jesus. Here's the, here's the first thing that I think we find in this story. As these guys are moving from Jerusalem, Jerusalem, seven miles towards Emmaus, they encounter hope. And that's because, number one, hope pursues us along life's journeys. Hope, hope kind of chases after us. Hope is running us down. Hope is on our trail. As this story begins, these two guys, they're running on empty when it comes to hope. They don't have any hope left inside. Their hearts have been pierced and their, 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 their hope has kind of leaked out. They were nobodies, and, and they didn't feel like anybody was for them. But as this story begins, the, the two guys running on empty have an encounter with hope, and they don't even realize it. You know, the Bible doesn't tell us much about these two guys, and I think that's intentional, because this is really not a story about them. This is a story about him. This is a story about the resurrection of Jesus, again, and the hope that it brings. But it just says there's two guys, and one of them is, is Cleopas. And, and we don't really know much about him. In fact, that's the only time his name is used in Scripture. That's it. Spelled this way. There's one other guy named Clopas. The E is missing. Clopas that's mentioned in Acts. And, and some scholars think it's the same guy. I don't know if it is or not. What I can tell you is his identity is not really important. But Christ says, Christ shows up and he's the one who they don't recognize, but in the end, he's the one who brings hope. These guys, they feel like they're nobodies. Have you ever been there? They were discouraged in their walk because things didn't go their way. Have you ever been there? Expectations not met. Plans don't go the way you wanted. Well, this is a story about how Jesus comes in the midst of despair and changes it all. Verse 13 again says, Now that same day two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. And as they talked and discussed these things, Scripture says Jesus himself came up. He came up. I, I like this. You know, Jesus, after rising from the dead, chases down two guys who were nobodies headed the wrong way. Right? And he could have done something else. Like Jesus could have sent an angel to them. He sent angels at other times. He could have sent an angel and said, hey, would you go and find those two guys and just, just confirm this happened? But he doesn't do that. Jesus gets on the same road, moving along with them as they're walking in the wrong direction. He chases them down. And he asks them, what's on your mind? I love this. He, he doesn't send an angel. He doesn't send a messenger. He doesn't like send a postcard. He doesn't call them on their cell phone. He doesn't go on their social media and see that they've posted about how bad their days are going and, 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 and respond with a heart emoji. Like this isn't his response. His response is to come and to get personal with them. He chases them down. These nobodies, he comes after them. He pursues them even though they probably didn't deserve that. I was thinking about it this week and I thought, if I were the Messiah... First of all, I'm not, not at all. That's my wife. If I were the Messiah and I had just died and rose again, who would I go after? Who would I go see? I think I probably would have chased down my family. 
I think I would have found my mama. Every boy wants to go and find his mama and tell her something good. I would have found my mama. I wouldn't want to have wanted her to feel heavy hearted. I'd have found my mama. I'd have, I would have looked out for my dad. I would have chased him down. I would have gone to my brother and my sister. I'd have gone to my, my cousins and my, my nieces and my nephews. I'd have, gone, I'd have gone to my children. I'd have gone to my family. And I would have said, hey, it's okay. I'm alive. I was thinking, you know, I, I might go to my friends. I might come to Pastor Andrew and say, hey, I know you're super concerned for me. I'm here. I'm alive. That might have been what I would have done. I might have even chased down after my enemies. I might have gone back and found Pilate and say, hey, I told you I was coming back because I'm the king. I told you, you're not the king. You're not the real ruler. I am. If I were Jesus, I think I'd have bypassed all that. I'd have gone straight to Rome. I'd have gone to Caesar because Caesar in his day proclaimed that he was God. I think I'd have shown up and said, ta-da, I'm God, not you. But Jesus doesn't do that. He doesn't go to his family. He doesn't just go to friends. He doesn't run after his enemies. He doesn't confront those who thought they were God and were delusional. Instead, he goes after two disheartened, discouraged guys who really aren't anybody. And I think that's a message that resonates with us because Jesus always seems to go out looking for, out of his way, looking for those who are somehow ordinary or obscure or maybe even overlooked. He did that with you, didn't he? Man, he did that with me. I'm a nobody. He came to me. He brought hope to me. He came to you. And that's because hope isn't really a commodity only for the elite, but hope, hope is... Hope is for you and it's for me and it's for everybody you encounter. Hope pursues us. Here's the second thing I think the story tells us and it too is just as important. Hope shows up when we least expect it. Hope, it, it shows up when, when we're not looking for it. Have you found that to be true? It only shows up really in life when life is not going your way. Hope, hope is that thing that kind of rises up against the tide of depression and against the tide of discouragement and against the tide of pain and sorrow and loss of job and, 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 and helplessness. Hope rises up in those moments when we least expect it, when things are bad and overwhelming, when life is dark, that's when the light of hope kind of breaks in because hope comes when we need it most. Hope doesn't show up on just the days that are good. Hope is most, most valuable when it shows up on those days that aren't so good. Listen again to what verse 20 says about these guys and, and their hearts. It says, the chief priests and our rulers, they're speaking, handed Jesus over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. And here's their words, but we had hoped that he was the one. We had hope. These three little words, it reveals kind of the depth of their pain and sorrow. We had hoped. And we, we were with him, but now we're not. We had believed, but now we don't. There's no reason to. If you're a, a fan of sports, you know what this feels like. Because it doesn't matter how many good years you have, there's going to be a year where you cry out, we had hoped we'd go all the way. We had hoped. Just this weekend, uh, there, was a, 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 there, there were a couple teams, but in the final four, there was, there was a team that, that played just a, a couple days ago, and they had hoped they would go all the way. North Carolina State had hoped they would go all the way. And, and I, I saw some posts from some, from some friends, and they said, well, we're kind of discouraged today. Look, if you pin your hopes on things that are going to fail you, you're going to walk in that kind of stuff all the time. But it's in those moments that Christ will remind you that he won't fail you. That even when your life seems to be falling apart, he's able to pull things back together. Look, these guys, I, I'm, just, I'm just shocked by the, the way Jesus shows up and how he handles them. They were saying, our hope is gone. We have no hope. The truth is, hope had just come really close to them. 
They just didn't see it. They just hadn't recognized it yet. They're kind of unobservant. And I wonder how often that happens in our lives. When we're walking the path of life and we feel hopeless, and if we would just open our eyes, we might see that hope is right there with us. Luke goes out of his way to, to kind of define their, their distance from hope. Again, I've said it a couple times, but they were on a journey heading the wrong way. They should have been right there waiting at the tomb, or they should have been gathering with the others ready to celebrate the promise of Christ that had come true. But they'd kind of given up, and they'd walked out, and they were on a, a path running, retreating really back somewhere where they, they felt safe and secure. They were leaving the place where they needed to be, heading in the wrong direction. And I, again, I, I just feel some, some similarities to these guys. Sometimes we get off track, don't we? If we're honest, we do the same thing. Life gets tough. We run. We want to escape. We want to retreat. We want to hide. If you've gone through a challenge at work, maybe you want to quit. You go through a challenge in the home and maybe you want to just run away. This is the, the natural sense of, of what happens in us when, when hope seems to dissipate. Too often we allow our circumstances to lead us down the wrong paths, making bad decisions. But even on the wrong path, hope can show up. And that's what happened to these guys. Verse 15 says, as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. And that's because hope has a name. And his name is Jesus. And Jesus is not willing for you to walk the wrong path without embracing you and pulling you back towards that better place, that place of hope that he's created for you. You know, I was thinking about it this week, and the truth is Jesus in, in physical body was walking with them, but, but for us, he's always with us. Hope is always with you. If hope has a name and his name is Jesus, he's always with you. In fact, this is one of the, the, the big defining marks of his greatness. He is omnipresent as God in flesh here. He is God in spirit with us. He is always with us. And that's his promise. In Matthew, he tells us, look, it doesn't matter what you go through. I will never leave you nor forsake you. I'm never walking out. I'm never walking away. I'm never abandoning you. It's one of his, his greatest attributes. The question is, are we aware of his presence and his closeness? The prophet Isaiah records the words of God as he speaks to his people, and these maybe could encourage you today. In, in Isaiah 43, in verse 2, he says, For when you go through deep waters, I'll be with you. When you go through rivers of difficulty, you're not going to drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned up, for the flames will not consume you. And why is that? It's because he's with you. Hope is with you. Hope is chasing you down. Hope is always present. Hope pursues us and it shows up when we least expect it. So don't overlook hope. Instead, be on the lookout for it. Wait for it. Expect it. Watch for it. Long for it and welcome his presence into your life. How about one more, one more key thought? And this is kind of where the, the story really takes an uptick and things seem to, to change. This is where their hearts are filled with joy. This is where they find again that not all is lost as they originally thought. The scripture really defines that hope comes alive in them and in us when we behold or when we see Jesus. I think it's what happens to these guys when they recognize him and they see that he's alive. You know, as a preacher, this is my favorite part because, again, it, it tends to, to focus on that thing to which I've given my life and which I've been called. Look at verse 25. It tells that, that Jesus shares scripture with them and as he walks through God's word, everything for them changes. It says in verse 25, for Jesus, he said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. 
Did not the Messiah, notice how he refers to those who have spoken as prophets, but when he refers to himself, he identifies himself as Messiah. It's like he doesn't want to, 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 to just get in their face, but he wants to lift them up and remind them that he is who he said he would be. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses, Luke says, and all the prophets, Jesus explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. There is this ongoing walking through all of the things that they had heard and learned all through their life. As, as Jewish young men, they would have been trained from early on about all of the things the prophets had written and said. And they would have known these scriptures. And, and, and this was what they had given their life really to studying all their days. And Jesus now pauses and he says, look, you guys have missed it. Let's backtrack a little bit. And he goes back to the beginning and he walks them through from Moses on every statement, every prophecy about himself. And he begins to show them how all of those things were fulfilled in himself, in Jesus. I think it changed everything for them. How many of you are old enough to remember that movie that came out in 1999? It was a blockbuster. It, it, was, it was kind of a strange movie called The Sixth Sense. Anybody recall that? It's a movie called The Sixth Sense. I'm not promoting that you should go watch it or anything like that. It was kind of weird. But the whole premise, and this is going to be a spoiler alert for you. If you haven't seen it, well, you've had since 1999, okay? But if you haven't seen it, here's, here's kind of the premise. There is this, this Im, 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 important character played by Bruce Willis who acts as a counselor to a young boy who's somewhat delusional. The boy believes he sees dead people. And Bruce Willis is the counselor who through the entire movie is just trying to help this boy move past his tendency to, to think that he sees dead people. Here's a spoiler alert. He does see dead people, and Bruce Willis is dead. The whole movie, you don't know that, though. From the beginning, you're, you're just watching it, and you're thinking, man, this counselor is, is so kind and gracious, and he's trying to help this boy, but this boy is just really messed up. This boy needs some help. And what you don't realize is through the entire movie, through the entire movie, the scenario is, 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 is as the boy says. He sees dead people. This is fictional. He sees dead people. And you don't know that until the very last scene. And you're shocked when you find it out. Now, you won't be because you know now. But you can only see that movie one time. Because the second time you see it, well, everything is seen differently because you know he's dead. And, and you see things the second time you didn't see the first time. Like, no one ever talks to Bruce Willis's character. No one ever engages. There are scenes where Bruce is, 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 this counselor is at home with his wife. She never looks at him. She never speaks to him. No one in the entire movie has interaction with this counselor except the one kid who sees dead people. You don't know that until you know it. But when you know it, it changes everything. Are you tracking with me? I think there's a parallel between that fictional movie and the reality of this story that, that Jesus is telling. He's revealing himself to them as the risen Christ. He, this, these stories are similar, except in the end of Bruce Willis's story, he's dead. In the end of Jesus' story, he's alive. And he goes back with these guys and he's telling them the story again. But now everything has changed because now he's revealing all of those prophecies and all of those statements and all of the moments throughout history and throughout his life that point to this moment where he is now alive and it changes everything. Everything. And once you know, you know. Look at verse 28. After walking for nearly two and a half hours, hearing Jesus speak to them, they arrive at home and they invite Jesus in for a meal. They say, would you come in and eat with us? 
Verse 28 says, As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, Stay with us, for it's nearly evening. The day's almost over. So he went in to stay with them. That's a key part of this story. Verse 30 says, When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. And then, then, after hearing the stories of Scripture and sitting with Jesus at the table... Then it says their eyes were open and they recognized him. And then what did he do? He disappeared from their sight. He's gone. You see, it wasn't so important that they saw him with their eyes. It was important that they knew him with their heart, for that changed everything for them. This story reminds me of that passage in Revelation 3 where Jesus writes to the church and he says to them, hey, if you will just invite me in, I'll go. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will go in and eat with that person and they with me. That was a message not to lost people. Jesus sent that to the church. That was a message to believers who, like these guys, maybe were a little bit disillusioned, maybe a little disheartened, maybe hopeless. And he says, listen, if you'll invite me in, I'll come and I'll give you hope. That's the way it works. Maybe that's the big takeaway today. Maybe that's where really all of this story and all of this message kind of hits home. That you and I would do as they did. That when we feel hopeless, when we feel disenchanted, when we feel empty and hurting inside, that we, like they, would turn to Scripture to find our hope renewed. That we would read it and we would study it and we would allow it to embrace us as we embrace Christ. And then maybe like them, we would do as they did and we would sit down and we would say, Jesus, would you just come near? You know, when hope is gone, that's when you need Christ to come near you and to hold you and to help you. When you're feeling like that, maybe this week in your discouragement, in your disheartened moments, in your despair, maybe things haven't gone the way you wanted. Maybe they don't feel much like a resurrection has just happened in your life and, and, and maybe you've lost your job or your kids have, have, have gotten bad grades and they're, they're not interested in, in, in your counsel. Maybe maybe husband and wife have been home fighting a lot. Maybe, maybe you just can't seem to find a friend to hang with and, and your life feels heavy in this moment. Find comfort in scripture and invite him to come near because his words to you are just like they were to those guys and just like they were to that church in Revelation. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. When that happens, it changes everything. It changes everything. You become courageous in your faith and you become contagious in your witness. Because now life is different for you. No longer are you running on empty, now you're running on full. Right? There's something good. And, and things that are good bear being told. For these guys, Jesus is there and then he's gone. But look what they do in verse 32. It says they turn to each other. They ask each other, were not our hearts burning within us? This is like the good heartburn. Were not our hearts burning within us while we talked with, while, while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? And then they got up and they returned at once to Jerusalem. They knew now they had headed in the wrong direction. That two and a half hour trip, I bet it took them like 25, 30 minutes to run back that seven miles all the way back to Jerusalem. And as they did, they arrive. And the scripture said that they find the 11 and those with them assembled together in verse 34 and saying, it is true, the Lord has risen. Folks, that's the power of the resurrection. That's the power of hope. It can change your life, not just turn your day around, it can turn your life around. And I just challenge you today to have an encounter with Jesus, to trust in his word, and to walk in faith. Would you stand with me this morning? 
it's time for us to, to wrap up and go. And, and I, here's what I want to do. Uh, Z, if you'd come. I, I want to I pray two prayers this morning. One, I want to I pray for those of you maybe that need to put your trust in Jesus. Maybe you need, like, like many others here have already done, you need to kind of settle things with Christ. You need to say, Lord, I believe and I confess not only that you are Savior, but I need a, I need a Savior. And I want to I lead you in prayer just to, to kind of make things right with God so hope would come in. But then I want to pray a second prayer for the rest of us. And maybe you've already given your heart to Christ, but maybe today you find yourself like Cleopas and his friend. You've been walking a road that's kind of lonely, and you feel a little bit heavy-hearted. And maybe in the midst of this, you just need to be encouraged. You need Christ to come near. You need to recognize his presence and you need to hear his voice. You need to feel his hand upon you and you need to have your, your hopelessness replaced with hopefulness. If you would bow your heads with me. This morning, if you've listened to this message and you've heard me talk about Christ and his coming and the promise of his resurrection and, and the, uh, the point of all of that being to forgive you of your sin, to save you, to give you a, 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 a new bent on life and a promised eternity, and you'd like to experience that kind of salvation moment, then maybe you'd pray a prayer something like this. I'll just kind of prompt you and you can pray the prayer I'm praying, but, but make it your own. Maybe right where you are, you'd say, Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for the message of this story and how you brought life to those who were, who were struggling. Jesus, the truth is I've been struggling. I've been walking the wrong path a long time. I've been doing life my way and it's, it's not been working very well. I realize I've made lots of choices and decisions that are displeasing to you and to others. God, even bigger than that, I, I realize that my life has just been stained with, with the sin of humanity, and I, I want that changed. God, I want my, my life to be forgiven because of the work of Jesus on the cross. So today, I, I confess my sin. Just tell him, today I confess my sin, but I also confess that Jesus is Lord. So would you save me? Would you apply his work on the cross to my life? Would you give me strength to live every day for you? Would you give me hope, I pray, in this life and for eternity? In Jesus' name. Head still bowed for just a moment. Pastor Andrew will come in a moment. I'm sure he'll give some direction for those of you who maybe committed your life to Christ today. But if you did, I just want to tell you it's the best decision you've ever made. And I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud of you. For the rest of us, can I pray for you? Right where you are, if you need some hope, if you need kind of a, a dose of hope today, would you just agree with me, Heavenly Father? We pause again to ask, Lord, that you would meet with us the way you did with those two guys on that road to Emmaus. Would you do, Lord, for us what you did for them? Would you turn our attention to you and the promises of your word? And Jesus, as we choose to believe by faith that you did exactly as you had promised, and on that third day that you rose again, triumphant and victorious over all things, as you, as you promised you would, God, would you begin to stir within us a sense of hope? Today, God, we, we trust even when doubts arise. We, we choose to follow you rather than, than, than falter in our faith and, and, and run out of dismay in the wrong direction. Lord, as we turn to you, would you strengthen us? Would you encourage us in our hearts? Would you fortify our, 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 our faith and give us boldness, God? And Lord, in, in light of that, would you encourage us to contagious with what we've experienced that God we would share that with others as we journey in faith Lord may may we may we encounter those who need the same hope that we've been given Lord would you allow us to, to be bold in our sharing of that with our friends and our family Lord help us to remember that you who began a good work in us will complete it 
So now, Lord, today and always, we fix our eyes on you, the risen Christ, the source of our hope and our unwavering peace. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you give the Lord a big hand of gratitude and thanks for what he's done in you? Amen.